will be absolutely beneficial to you. There's some so so much richness here. Uh, I told you that I have three sermons left, but I did not tell you that we have three weeks left. Okay, so just three sermons. So there's because it would be absolutely Fletch criminal to spend five years in the Gospel of John just to rush through the truths of the resurrection and the appearances of Christ just to say we finished. I mean, we'll be done in just we'll be done before the fall. But uh, I do want you guys to get these truths, and they're absolutely phenomenal. So turn your Bibles with me tonight to the Gospel of John, chapter number 20. I, I trust everyone got a handout. Yes, I did get some toner from my printer. And uh, the quality is a little bit better. You may, you may have recognized, maybe. Uh, it's, it's laser quality, not inkjet quality. So we did get another toner for that. So we'll have those handouts back to you each week. The Gospel of John, chapter number 20. And by way of introduction in this portion of scripture, let me say that Jesus has, as we begin looking at this chapter, he has already risen from the dead. Peter and John have seen the empty tomb and they saw that Jesus has done what he said that he would do. He has conquered death. That part has been established. The one who bruised his heel, that serpent, was through the death of the Lord Jesus Christ destroyed. The destroyer was destroyed and death was destroyed. And so therefore, folks, for you and I that are believers, the power of death no longer grips us. We're no longer under the reign and the power of Satan or death. And the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ is so overwhelming Let me say this to you by way of introduction as well. I'm not going to spend a great deal of time here because a lot of this will be covered as we go. But if Jesus Christ has not been raised from the dead, your faith is what? It's it's empty. It's vain. We have no faith. And if Jesus Christ has been risen from the dead as He said that He was, this is phenomenal truth. This makes our faith rock solid. Right? And if you are a study or fletch of textual criticism as I am, you may be interested to find out that we have found a copy of the Gospel of Mark dating the first century. And it has the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I mean, we're talking less than 30 years from the actual autograph. The eyewitnesses were still around. That's, that's, that's vitally important. And that's why John said in our text we looked at last week, I was there. I saw everything that was going on. I verified these events. Luke says the same thing in Luke chapter 1. Oh, Theophilus, I want you to know that I'm writing to you to set some things straight. I have verified what I'm telling you by many witnesses. The New Testament is a book. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is an event that has and can be verified. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ is absolutely overwhelming. The evidence of it is overwhelming. We, folks, let me just give you a few things, if I, if I may. The stone was rolled away that was sealed and guarded by the Roman soldiers. It's gone. It's rolled away. There's a tomb that is empty. The only thing that is there are the grave clothes. The grave clothes were there lying wound just like they were wound around Jesus Christ. And the, and the linen cloth that covered His face was off to the side. Folks, listen. I want you to understand tonight that the linen cloths were not laying there in some type of heap. The linen cloths were laying there in the body in the shape of Christ. But He wasn't there because He just came right out of them. He didn't have to unwind Himself. He just came out of them. And that's real important that you understand that he has the power to do that when we later on in the text talk about him walking through walls. Okay. The testimony of the angels corroborate the fact that Jesus Christ is risen. Now folks, listen, all of that would have been for us enough evidence. For anyone, that would have been enough evidence. But Jesus Christ adds a coup de grace of evidence to all of these other evidences. He adds an evidence that is no doubt 
that is irrefutable, and that is the evidence of a personal, bodily, literal, face-to-face confrontation with human beings. And as we come to this passage of of John chapter 20, we find the greatest proof of the resurrection of Jesus Christ in that He appears bodily to His own. Now, the only way that the critics can get around this and try to explain it away and try to add their problem is, is, well, where did you get Jesus? I mean, if he was dead, how do you get him alive again? Well, the critics come off and say, well, the first way that they do that, first possibility of how they conjure this thing up is that he only reappears spiritually in their minds. That they conjured it up so they were so desperate That they wanted Jesus alive again so bad that they actually thought they saw him and so they conjured up this this resurrection. There was a conspiracy theory among the followers of Christ, but as we're going to see later on, that is absolutely ridiculous. They would have in no way conjured up a resurrection. The other theory says, Brother Wendell, that he wasn't really dead. That's called the swoon theory. And the swoon theory says that what happened was this. Well, when Jesus was on the cross, he went into a what we'll call a, a semi-coma state. And when he was taken down from the cross and when he was put in that cool tomb and the spices were applied to him, they, you know, they kind of revived his senses. He woke up, stood up, pushed the stone away and walked out. Now, folks, I don't know about you, but that takes probably more faith or ignorance to believe that than it was to have the faith to believe in the literal resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the problem with both of those theories, and the list goes on and on, but the problem with both of those theories is there's monumental proof that Jesus Christ was actually dead. The Roman soldiers who crucified people frequently. In fact, I read this this week, that during the time of the life of Christ, the Roman soldiers crucified no less than 30,000 people. 30,000 people in that lifespan of Christ, the Roman soldiers crucified. And those guys who were experts in execution, they knew when someone was dead and when they were not dead. That's why when they came to Jesus, they did not break his legs because they knew that he was already dead. Not only that, but remember we looked at last time that when the spear was thrust in the side of Christ, it manifests his death because out of that wound came blood and water. When the pericardium sac around the heart was burst, out came blood and water indicating that Jesus Christ's heart had actually ruptured. And so he was dead. Joseph and Nicodemus, who took Jesus off the cross and cared for him, would have known if he was dead or not. And the women who anointed the body of Jesus, who wrapped his body, would have known that he was dead. There was no question about the fact that Jesus Christ was, in fact, dead. No question. Too many people to verify his death. But not only, folks, is there, is there no question about the fact that Jesus Christ was actually dead. But at the same time, as we enter chapter 20, there is absolutely no doubt about the fact that Jesus Christ is now alive. He is alive. He has, in fact, physically and literally and bodily resurrected from the grave, just like he said that he would do. In Mark chapter 14 and verse 28, we read these words, But after I am raised up, I will go before you into Galilee. And there Jesus is predicting His own resurrection. In John chapter 2, Jesus says these astounding words to those who were about Him when He says, Destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up again. And of course, they thought that he was talking about the temple in Jerusalem. And the Jews said, 46 years was this temple in building, and you're going to raise it up in three days? Another classic example of, this, of, this, of the inability of them to understand spiritual truth. And then John says in verse 21 of John 2, he, but he spake of the temple of his body. And so Jesus Christ promised, folks, that he would be dead and that he would 
rise again. And he did it. He did it. And now to announce and authenticate his resurrection, you bring the four gospel accounts together. Now get this, folks. We find in those four gospel accounts that Jesus appeared no less than 11 times to no less than 500 different people. Now, I dare say you need a lot fewer people, witnesses than that to corroborate any evidence in a court. 500 testimonies to the risen Christ. When you're in a court of law, all you need is two. And Jesus has no less than 500 people who saw him alive. Now, it's interesting that Jesus, that when he appears to the eleven, the 11 appearances that we know about rather, that he only appears to his believers. He never appears to unbelievers. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was God and I had been mocked the way that I was mocked and beaten and treated the way that I was treated, what would you do? Well, what I'd do when I got, when I rose from the dead, I would uh, go up to the scribes and Pharisees and I would say, ha! I told you Here I am. Do you believe me now? Or as that old song goes that I hear some people sing, how do you like me now? That's me. Aren't you glad I'm not God? But he never, because Jesus never does that. He never appears to those but who are his own. And many critics of the scripture will say, well, if Jesus really rose, then then would not he wanted to appear to the skeptics rather than the believers? But the problem with that, folks, is that the believers were the skeptics. And the idea of manufacturing a resurrection is ridiculous because in all of the appearances of Jesus, they never expected him to arise. In fact, in almost every appearance of Jesus, they didn't even recognize. And in fact, as we saw last time, even Peter and John had to acknowledge in verse 9 that they did not know the scripture that said that he must rise from the dead. And not knowing and not believing that he would rise, they would therefore not manufacture a resurrection. That's ridiculous. They were shocked whenever he appeared. And in fact, they never even really understood that he was for real. In fact, when he, when he appeared to them in the upper room, what did they say? It's a phantom. It's a ghost. And you say, well, why didn't he appear to the scribes? Well, I mean, why didn't Jesus? I mean, again, I'm talking in terms of my deity. I mean, why did he plant himself right down in Jerusalem and says, here I am, everybody. Try this one on for size. This is fulfilling prophecy. Let me give you a couple of suggestions of why Jesus didn't do that. Number one, Jesus didn't do that because he was through with Israel. He was through with Israel. By this time, he had, he had postponed the kingdom for Israel. And in fact, back, if you back up to Matthew chapter 12, or since Matthew chapter 12, he had turned his attention and began to call his church so there would not be any national issue with Israel. Secondly, now, now get this point as well. Jesus Christ never took the root of miracles as the only way to communicate who he was. Jesus never took the root of miracles as the only way to communicate who he was. What I mean by this, by that is this. Jesus' plan for all the ages of the church was that you and I and men and women like us would be his witnesses. Not that he would perform some personal, some spectacular, some supernatural appearance to every unbeliever to prove himself. That's our job. He never intended to go that route. But rather what he would do is that he would confirm the faith of those who already believed in him and they in turn would go out empowered by the Spirit of God to bring men to repentance and announce to them the gospel of the resurrection. That's how God, that's how Jesus intended to do it. And so Jesus' method was never to personally go to the unbelievers to convince them. That was not his method. That was not his way. 
And what good would it have done Jesus to appear to three or four of the Pharisees? If he had appeared, if he had appeared to three or four of the Pharisees, none of the other Pharisees would have believed him anyway. So what good would it have been done? Besides that, does not the word of God... Remember the story that Jesus told back in Luke, I believe it's chapter 16. Jesus told the story about the rich man, Lazarus. The rich man down there in Hades, and he's in torment. The Bible says, that, you know, can you send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger and, and put it on my tongue because I'm tormented in this flame? And he says, you know, I can't do it. There's a great gulf fixed between us. And he says, well, Father Abraham, can you send my brother, can you send Lazarus back? Because I have some brothers and I don't, and I don't want them to come to this horrible place. And what was Abraham's response? If they do not believe Moses and the prophets, they would not believe though someone, what? Rose from the dead. And so Jesus knew that appearing to the unbelievers would not have done any good anyway. If Jesus had appeared to the unbelievers, the, the, the evidence would have been lost for they would not have believed because their minds were blinded by the God of this world. And so Jesus stays and he appears to his own. And he stays and he appears to his own because get this folks, they are and we are the key to everything that's going to happen in the years to come. You and I and the, and the apostles and the believers that follow Christ are the very stage on which the gospel is being presented throughout history. And they must have their faith confirmed. And they must have confidence in a resurrected living Christ. And if they are convinced beyond any shadow of a doubt that Jesus Christ is truly raised from the dead, and if they are empowered by the Spirit of God, God will send them out to do the job He wants done. And so in all of His appearances, He appears only to His own. And let me add another thought here. Out of all these appearances, John only picks three to talk about. John is very, very careful to select what he wants to select by the aid of the Spirit of God. And in this passage, as always with John, he wants to proclaim who Jesus is, and that is Jesus is God. And he wants not only to, to show that Jesus is God, folks, but listen, he wants to show us a little bit of what God is like. If you will, he wants to show us, and I love these passages from here on to the end, because Jesus kind of shows us a different side of God. In his dealings with the, with the, uh, the appearances, with his dealings with Peter, with his dealings with the two disciples on the Emmaus Road, he, showed us, he shows us kind of a different side of God. Not a side that we haven't seen already. But I think it's wonderful and beautiful that, it's, that as John ends his gospel, he ends his gospel, his gospel showing us the loving side of a holy God. And that's what he does. And he picks these three separate appearances in order to do that. One was to Mary Magdalene. The other was to the two disciples. And the third appearance was to Thomas. And in each case, they are to verify the bodily resurrection of Christ for a very direct purpose. Now let's look at the first one. And I've, and I've entitled this not the appearance to Mary Magdalene, but I've entitled this one, He Shows Himself Faithful. He Shows Himself Faithful. I believe that the fact that Jesus Christ appears to Mary Magdalene is absolutely phenomenal. And understand this, and you have to understand Jewish thinking. Not only the fact that He showed Himself to Mary Magdalene was phenomenal, but the fact that He showed Himself first to a woman was phenomenal. That would have knocked the Jewish people off of their feet because in the Jewish culture women were property women had no rights they had no say so and for Jesus to pick a woman to be the first one he appears to absolutely phenomenal but he picks a woman because he wants to show himself to be faithful here's a woman and she's nothing spectacular I mean, she had been saved out of a life of horrible, horrible sin. In fact, if you remember correctly, Mary Magdalene was the person in whom Jesus Christ cast out seven demons. 
She was a sordid kind of woman. She was not an apostle. She had no primary place in the ministry. In fact, Mary Magdalene had no ongoing ministry in the church that we know of. But he appears to this woman for the express purpose of showing his personal loving faithfulness to one disciple no matter how insignificant that one disciple may think he or she is. Folks, this is a powerful, powerful lesson. And perhaps at first thinking, we would think that, well, his first appearance should have, would have been to Peter or John or one of the other apostles. Was it really necessary for Jesus to have appeared to anybody? No. It, it wasn't necessary for him to do it at all. But Jesus is a loving God, and he does this for a particular reason. He picks one person who perhaps loved him more deeply and more dearly than anybody else loved him. And he picked her to appear to first. You know, I'd probably say, folks, you men, that in, that in Christianity, women get a bad rap, don't they? In a lot of churches. Praise God, this isn't one of them. But I've known a lot of ministries and a lot of churches where, where women really get a bad way to go. I have been encouraged in my study of women in the Scripture. Women play an absolutely phenomenal part in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Such a phenomenal part that He chooses this woman to appear to as the first to show his loving faithfulness. Because folks, listen, this is the kind of God that we have. This is the kind of Christ that we have. We don't have a God who, according to the writer of Hebrews, who, who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. We have a God, we have a Christ who gets down and feels what we feel. And He loves us on a personal and an individual basis. And this is the thrilling thing for me in, the, in knowing Christ. Folks, listen. We're not in a religious system. We're not in a system. This is a living, loving relationship with a personal God. And we see that graphically. In Jesus' encounter with Mary Magdalene. Brother Blue, would you mind turning on the fans? Thank you. We have uh, some warm individuals, myself included. For those of you who are cold, I apologize. <laughs> and so Jesus comes to Mary Magdalene. And he comes to show us his faithfulness and his love, his character. <clears throat> Let's look at it. Beyond operating the universe and upholding all things by the word of his power, beyond commissioning the disciples, and beyond all the other things that he had to take care of before he was to ascend, the first thing that Jesus was on Jesus' agenda was to show those who loved him how much he loved them. Isn't that good? He met them at their need. Now look at verse 11. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher, weeping. Stop right there. Here you got Mary Magdalene. She's come to the sepulcher, the first day of the week to anoint the body, the day after the Sabbath. She gets there, the stone's rolled away. Remember what she did? She went back to tell the guys, hey, the stone's rolled away. Jesus is gone. And here comes Peter and John, right? They come running to the tomb. And John's in better shape, so he outruns Peter. He gets there first, but he doesn't dare go in. And Peter gets there, he goes down. He sees the linen clothes. <coughs> Peter and John go home. And here's Mary Magdalene. It says in verse 10, they went home. 
And here's Mary Magdalene. And the Bible says she hung around. And the Bible says she was standing at the sepulcher weeping. And in the Greek, it is a, it is a constant. It is an unrestrained sobbing. She can't control herself. She can't stop crying. I mean, this woman is really torn apart. She gives her tears full course. And her helpless love is just sobbing and sobbing and sobbing. Why? Because Jesus wasn't there. And she couldn't figure out where He was. She wanted to know where He was even if He was dead. She just wanted Him there. Just even if he was still dead, just to know that he was there. That's what she wanted to know. You know, Mary Magdalene had the most glorious kind of love, but the weakest kind of faith. And the sad part about all this is where her tears were so needless. She was crying about nothing. She's like Hagar in Genesis who was standing there by a well and didn't know it. I mean, all she needed to do was turn around and there was Jesus. But she stood there sobbing uncontrollably, constantly. But rather, they acknowledged the fact that Jesus was alive. That's why he wasn't in the tomb. She was lost in the sorrow of the fact that the best she could do with this whole picture is that somebody stole the body of Jesus. But the thing I like about the Lord is the Lord wasn't going to leave Mary in her sorrow. Because he promised that he wouldn't, he promised that he would not leave them there. Remember back in John chapter 16 and verse 20, listen to this. Truly, truly, I say unto you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be full of sorrow, but your sorrow will be turned to joy. He said it's going to be like a woman having a baby. It hurts while you're having the baby, but when the baby comes, oh, what joy. And then in verse 22, Jesus says, I will see you again. And your heart shall rejoice and your joy no one can take from you. What a promise. What a hope. That the joy we have because of the resurrection, no one can take from us. That was the promise of the Lord. And Jesus said, your sorrow will turn to joy. And he found the most sorrowing person available. And he used her as a living example of how love reaches down and turns sorrow into joy. And she was crying about something that she didn't need to cry about. But you know what, folks? Aren't we like that? J.C. Ryle said this, Two-thirds of the things we fear in life never happen. Two-thirds of all our tears are shed needlessly in vain and thrown away. Of course, he said it with a British accent. And he's right. He's absolutely right. And so her tears are tears from a frustrated heart. She doesn't understand. She just knows he's not there. He couldn't possibly have did what he said he was going to do. He's just not there. Somebody stole his body. And I don't care if he's still dead. I just want him here. Continue down. And as she stood there without the sepulcher weeping and she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher and see two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had been laid. Mary stooped down in her, in her sob and in her tears. She walks over and she takes a look and she, she stoops down and, and she sees two angels. And she probably didn't recognize them as angels, but she certainly didn't recognize them as criminals. Uh, Luke, uh, Mark, rather, in chapter 16 and verse 5 indicates that they were in the form of a man. And Luke says in his gospel in chapter 24 and verse 4 that they were, that there were two men sitting. And so these two angels took on the form of young men. And where were they? 
They were sitting on the slab where the body of Jesus had been laid, one at his head and the other at his feet. Now again, she naturally didn't assume they were criminals. And yet she had no idea who they were, as is evidenced by her response. Mary's eyes were blurred with tears. She saw them, but didn't see them. You know, you got to just look through somebody. That's what Mary did. But it's kind, of an, it's kind of an interesting thing, and I want to interject here a footnote <clears throat> that I think, is, uh, I think is an important part. And this is the important thing that I want you to wrap your brains around tonight in this section, because this is very interesting. That angels are always around when God's doing His work. And here is the greatest work that God ever did. And who do you have? You have two angels. And the interesting thing about this, these two angels, is that one is sitting on one end and one is sitting on the other. You say, well, Pastor, what's so significant about that? Well, I'm glad you asked. If one angel is on one end and the other angel is on the other end, where was Jesus? Jesus. He had been in the middle. That suggests something to me that's very, very exciting. And let me share it to you with you with it with you real quick. When I read that, my mind went back to the book of Exodus, chapter 25. And in Exodus chapter 25, God was instructing the people of Israel who were building the tabernacle on how to build the Ark of the Covenant. Now the Ark of the Covenant had on top of it. A place called what, class? The mercy seat. And on that mercy seat, once a year, the high priest would go in and take the blood of the sacrifice and would sprinkle the blood of the sacrifice onto the mercy seat. And that is where, that is where God met men. That mercy seat was, that Ark of the Covenant was back in the most holy of holies. Only the high priest could go back there because that was actually where the presence of God was. That was where God met men. In other words, by the shedding of the blood of the sacrifice, that act of faith, God met men at the mercy seat. Are you with me? Make sense? Now let me show you this mercy seat. In Exodus chapter 25 and verse 17, don't turn there, just write it down. It says this, God says, Thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be the length of it, and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth of it. And thou shalt take two cherubs, that's angels, of gold, of beaten work, shalt thou make them in the two ends of the mercy seat and make one cherub on one end, the other cherub on the other end, even of the mercy seat shall you make the cherub thereof. Now listen, now write down verse 22. And there I will meet with you. Where did God meet man throughout the Old Testament? He met men between the two angels on the mercy seat where the blood had been sprinkled. Listen, Jesus Christ left the tomb. Where does God meet men? He meets them between the two angels, but the mercy seat is no longer there because the Ark of the Covenant is not there. The mercy seat is the resurrected Christ. And John, under the divine inspiration, is very clear to point out to us that the two angels are positioned in the new mercy seat just like they were positioned on the old mercy seat of the Old Testament. God meets us on the basis of the resurrected living Christ. Folks, listen, there is a new mercy seat and nobody needs to go in and sprinkle blood there anymore. The blood has been sprinkled, according to Hebrews, once for all. The sacrifice of Christ has taken care of sin. It is no longer an issue. It is no longer a problem. And she looked there. When Mary looked down in that tomb, she did see just two angels. She saw a new mercy seat, the blood of the Lamb. 
the resurrected Christ. And I don't think it's any accident whatsoever that these two angels were positioned just like they were positioned on the Ark of the Covenant. Boy, that's good. Boy, that's good. You can find the Old Testament, New Testament all over the place. I got, in the old, I got down in the Sunday school class this morning with the teens and I said, turn to Genesis chapter 22. They said, what? You never preach from the Old Testament. And I guess. I guess. Well, the angel spoke to Mary in verse, boy, that's good. That's good stuff. Well, the angel spoke to Mary in verse 13. He said, woman, what are you crying about? And as I said to you before, woman in this culture wasn't a sign of disrespect. It was actually a, a term of respect. When you went up to a, a young lady or a female and said, woman, now you get your head knocked off, guys. But back in this culture, it was a, it was a dignified thing to go up to somebody and call them a woman. And the angel said, woman, what are you crying about? What are you weeping? Says in verse 13. Why are you weeping? There's nothing to cry about, woman. What are, you, what are you crying about? And she says, because they have taken what? My Lord. And I don't know where they have put him. Not they've taken the Lord, but they've taken my Lord. He belongs to me. He belongs to me. And they've taken my Lord. I don't know where they've put him. Her grief, folks, is due to the fact that she doesn't know where the body of Jesus is. Even though Mary at this point still believes he's dead, he is still her Lord. And she had come there and there was no Jesus. And she feels empty. And she says, they've taken away my Lord. And she's just weeping and weeping and sobbing the whole time she's saying this. You know, I, I, Mary is like most of the disciples. I can't say a whole lot about her faith. But boy, we could sure say a lot for her love. What a woman. To have the past that she had, what a woman. You know, folks, I pray, I pray God that I might have that kind of love. The kind of love that loves Christ so much that I just beg for his presence. I just beg for his presence. And the kind of affection and the kind of love that when we're separated even for just a, a tiny bit, the result is tears and sobbing. But the sad reality is in the church today, we just don't know how to love like that anymore. We don't know how to do it. And it's so easy for us to get to stray and to get, uh, you know, so, so get so cold and indifferent and callous. And, and we stray away from the warmth of a personal experience, of a vital relationship with Jesus Christ, and really not even care. Well, no answer came from the angels. He didn't say a thing to her. And so she, she turns around. And when she turns around, verse 14, wow, does she get an eyeful. And when she had said this, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. Here he is. But she, but she doesn't know it. She doesn't know it. I mean, she's looking face to face at the resurrected Christ and doesn't even know it. You say, well, uh, if she knew him very well, that's a, that's, a, that's a bit strange, isn't it? You're right. I mean, she followed him for three years and not recognized him, that is a bit strange. You know, how is it that she didn't recognize him if she knew him so well? Well, again, I like to give you what some commentators say. One commentator said, well, she had her hair in her eyes from crying so much that she really couldn't see. Another one said, well, her tears blurred her eyes and she couldn't recognize him. Another one said, the lack of faith, she didn't expect to see him anyway. I've got a better thought, or at least I think it's a better thought. I think when she saw Jesus, there was something different about him. 
I think it was something different about him that made it impossible for her to recognize him apart from him disclosing to her who he was. You say, well, why do you say that? Well, I say that because of this. Mark chapter 12, verse 2 says this, that Jesus Christ had a, a terra morphe. Mark chapter 16, verse 12, Jesus, the Bible of Mark says that Jesus had hetera morphe. And hetera is a word that means different. And morphe means speaking about a former body. And so what Mark reveals to us there in chapter 16 that Jesus Christ's resurrected body was a different form. Do you see that? You don't get that in English. Jesus' body was a different form form. And the reason that Jesus Christ was so hard to recognize is that He was in His glorified body. He had another form about Him. His body now was a supernatural body. It was a body that could eat fish and honeycomb but yet pass through walls. I don't know what it was and, and I'm sure it wasn't a little thing around His head that looked like a halo. I'm sure that's not what the difference was. But I'm sure that there was some type of difference about his form that made, him, that made it impossible for anyone to recognize him immediately apart from him disclosing who he was. And this evidence seems to that seems to be overwhelming. For example, remember on the road to Emmaus? The two disciples walked along. What does it say? They didn't know who he was. And then the Bible says that he opened what? Their eyes. And then they recognized. By direct revelation, he disclosed himself to them. And even as far as Matthew chapter 28 and verse 17, when they should have known, it says, and when they saw him, this is the 11 disciples clear up in Galilee. That's after the occasion we're reading about here. When they saw him, they worshiped him. What? But some doubted. Some doubted. Another time that Jesus was standing on the shore and they were not too sure that, that it was Him. They didn't know who He was. It was only when Jesus Christ revealed Himself by divine revelation in their minds and hearts that they knew who He was. And that's a truism, folks, if there ever was one. No one at any time throughout history in the dealing of God's dealing with man has ever known God apart from God revealing Himself to them. Man can't wake up on Monday morning and says, Oh, gee willikers, I have a desire to know God. Not going to happen on your own. I was addressing one of my children this afternoon. James came to me, or Craig, came to me with tears in his eyes. And I said, what's wrong, son? I was standing up here uh, looking at something, and he came to me and tears in his eyes. And he says, Dad, he said, he said, I witnessed to our two neighbor boys today, and they told me they weren't saved. I said, well, that's good. He said, Dad, they told me that they were not saved. I said, well, son, at least they recognize that much. He said, but Dad, they didn't want anything to do with it. I said, son, let me show you something. And I took him to John 6. And I said, son, read. I, had, I said, well, John, son, read verse 44. And he got up on his tiptoes and read, looked over here in the pulpit and says, no man has the power to come to me except the Father who sent me draws him. I said, son, it's not up to you. I said, I appreciate your heart for souls and I appreciate your broken heart over them. But I said, you would drive yourself bats if you think for one moment that them not coming to Christ or coming to Christ had anything to do with you. It's not you. And you are not made by God to carry that kind of a burden. And all throughout the history of God's dealing with men, nobody ever knew God. Except God revealed himself to him. In fact, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that a man only knows Christ by the Spirit of Christ. That's it. No man can say Lord or Jesus is Lord except God didn't testify it in him. And since the Spirit had not yet come to indwell them, 
That's one of the reasons that we'll see later why I don't believe in the upper room they actually received the Spirit. Because apart from the direct revelation of Christ, no one would recognize God. And apart from direct revelation, Mary didn't know who Jesus was. Then he begins to reveal himself in such a beautiful way. Verse 15, Jesus says, Woman, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? Can you, can you hear the compassion? Can you hear the compassion? Woman, why are you crying? What are you looking for? And Mary in her moping attitude is not searching for the Lord. And the Bible says in verse 15 that Mary thought he was the gardener. One commentator said that I read after that Jesus must have come out of the tomb and tomb and went and got some gardener's clothes on. You know, it's really funny what some people actually put in print. Quite yes, they do. Anything to discredit the supernatural. Must have been. You know, Mary probably thought, hey, it's the beginning of the morning. This guy's the gardener. He's come to, to take care of the flowers, you know, to, to water them, to pluck out the weeds, do whatever he does. And she says, sir, if you've removed him from here, tell me where you've put him. I'll bury him somewhere else. Man, what love. You know, sir, if you needed this tomb back so soon and we were in such a hurry to bury him because we wanted to make it to Passover or before Passover... You know, and you moved him out of the tomb because you needed to, just let me know where you put him, and I'll take the body and I'll bury him myself. This woman by herself. Just tell me where you've put the body of my Lord, and I'll go and bury him myself. Her love for Jesus Christ is so deep, and her zeal is so true and rich, death can't break it. But she doesn't recognize him and she thinks he's a gardener. She's, over, she's so overwhelmed with what's going on and she's so overwhelmed with love. And oh, I love this next part. Verse 16, Jesus said to her, Miriam. That's all he said. Miriam. Mary is the Greek form. Miriam is the Aramaic form. For Miriam. He spoke her original name in her original language. The name that only her family knew. Her friends knew her by that name. And this was a name by which he always referred to her. Miriam. That's all he had to say. She had in the meantime turn back toward the tomb. And then when she heard Miriam, well, she spun around real fast. And she sees Jesus. And she says, Rabboni. Master. She recognized the soft voice of Jesus. When he said, Miriam. And Mary, the word Rabboni is infrequently used of men, but very frequently used of God. And so Mary Magdalene acknowledges much to the joy of John the Apostle that Jesus is God. He said, boy, I didn't have to work for that one. Mary, you said it for me. Rabboni. You say, well, how does she know it was Jesus just by one word? Listen, when you love somebody and you hear that somebody speak your name, you know them, don't you? You say, prove it. Listen to this. I will prove it to you. Thanks for the challenge. John chapter 10. I love this. To him the porter openeth. 
that is the true shepherd. And the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by what? By name. You know that he knows your name? He knows everything about you. He knows the number of hairs on your head. And he loves you in a personal way. Don't you see what John's trying to teach us here? We don't have an indifferent Christ. We don't have a cold, calculating Christ. We have a warm, intimate, loving Christ. And he says in John chapter 10 and verse 3, His sheep hear His voice. He calls His sheep by name and He leads them out. And the sheep follow Him for they know His voice. Verse 27, My sheep hear My voice and I know them and they what? They follow Me. All He had to do was say her name. Just like the great shepherd. The day I got saved, he called my name. And you know what? I knew who it was. I knew who it was. That's all he had to say. All he had to say was Michael, Jason, Don, Eugene. And we know the name. That's all Jesus had to say was her name, and she knew it. She knew him. The other Gospels tell us that when she recognized Him, what did she do? She fell at His feet and began to clutch to His legs. Boy, she's she's clutching Him. She's hanging on to Him. And the tears, she's she's thrilled. He's alive. He's really here. And and she falls at His feet and grabs onto His ankles. Not only have I found him, but he's not only have I found his body, but he's standing here and he's alive. It's overwhelming, and her emotions are just pouring out. She's just gushing emotion all over the place, and probably crying more profusely than she was before. And she says, Lord, I've got a grip on you now. I'm never going to let go of you. You're not going anywhere now. I'm never letting you out of my sight. What love. She hangs on and reminds you, reminds me rather, of the book of the Song of Solomon where the Shulamite woman says in the Song of Solomon, I have found him whom my soul loveth. I held him and I wouldn't let him go. That was Mary Magdalene at the tomb. It's the same kind of thing. She loved Christ and she's hanging on to him. What absolute sweet love. And then the Lord speaks to her and says this in verse 17. Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend to my Father and your Father, and to your Father, and to my God and your God. Now, it may appear, I want to explain to you something that, that has, has hounded theologians for years, but I want to explain something to you where where Jesus says to her, touch me not. Touch me not. That's a mistranslation. Uh, Jesus in the original Greek uses the word optu, which means to cling, which means to clutch. And he doesn't use the word in the original Greek apstao, which means to touch. And so what Jesus is actually saying to Mary here is don't cling to me. Stop hanging on to me. Stop grabbing me so tight. It's in the imperative because I have to ascend to my Father. Mary, the relationship is going to be different now. I'm not going to live with you. I'm going to live where? In you. It's going to be different. And I need you to stop. Don't hang on me. I'm not going to stay. I'm only going to be here for 40 days. I must ascend to my Father. And it reminds me of what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 16. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet, not, yet now henceforth know we Him no more. In other words, you and I have never had a fleshly relationship with Christ. Our relationship with Christ has always been spiritual. And so he's saying, Mary, this whole thing, this whole situation is going to be different. There's a new kind of fellowship. 
A personal communion where I'm going to live inside you. So don't cling on to me. I want you to go, and this is good, and tell my brothers. I want you to go and tell my brothers. You see that in verse 17? Go to my brethren. And I want you to underline that in your Bibles because that's a new thing too. Go and tell my brothers. Disciples have been called slaves. Disciples have been called friends. But never until now have disciples been called brothers. And here's something exciting and something thrilling, something new. We have a whole new relationship with Christ. Not like a servant or not like a slave. Not like a friend as in John 15 where he said, I used to call you servants, but now I call you friends. Here he says, I used to call you friends, now I'm calling you what? Brothers. You say, how in the world, what in the world is going on? How in the world, Jason, can I be a brother with Jesus Christ? We can be brothers with Jesus Christ because we are, now, under, now follow me here, we are by virtue of his death and resurrection and our identification with it. Now watch this, we are in Christ. Now let me explain to you what I mean by that. In Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 11, the Bible says that Jesus Christ tasted death for everyone who would ever believe. And then in verse 10, that he brought many sons to glory. And then verse 11, for both he that sanctifieth, that is the one that made holy, that's Christ, and they that are made holy, that's us, are all one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them what? Brothers. In other words, now watch this, because of our faith in Christ, we have become brothers with Christ. Christ is the perfect son of righteousness, right? When you and I receive Christ, his righteousness is imputed to us. That's the doctrine of justification, right? His righteousness is imputed to us. Therefore, in the eyes of God, you and I are perfectly righteous because we are in Christ. You say... No way, preacher. I'm not as good as Christ. My friends, listen to me. Positionally, before God, you are as good as Jesus Christ. You say, that's a heavy thought. Yeah, it is. But it's also true. You say, I'm, a, I'm not as good as Christ. You're right. Practically, you're not. Practically, we're boneheads. But positionally, the way God sees us as his own, I'm just as good as Jesus Christ. Wow. That don't help you what will. Bet you never saw that in the resurrection before. I mean, let's look at it this way. Can God take anyone to his presence who isn't perfect and holy? No, he can't. He will not. So then how do we get there if we're not perfectly holy? And good. You get there because you are perfectly holy and good. You say how? By your union with Jesus Christ. His righteousness becomes yours. When you receive Jesus Christ, positionally, God looks at you as holy as Jesus. That's a fantastic thought. You say, preacher, support it. All right, I will. Glad you asked. Romans chapter 8 and verse 29. And I'll show you a couple of passages and point this out. And I'm going to draw a conclusion that's exciting. And hopefully I can do it in two minutes. Romans chapter 8 and verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, he did predestinate, this is God, to be conformed to the image of his son, that his son might be the firstborn among many brethren. Okay? Now hang with me. Hang on to this thought. Christ is the firstborn among many brethren. All who come to God through Christ are in Christ. Therefore, Christ's righteousness becomes our righteousness. Therefore, righteously speaking, we are equal to Christ in the eyes of God. 
And here's the good part. Here's the best part. God foreknew that. God determined that before the foundation of the world. He determined before the foundation of the world that in October of 1985, he would look down into Scottsville, Virginia, Calvary Baptist Church, and he would see Michael Huffman as equal with Jesus Christ. Because if we weren't, we'd have no hope of getting into heaven. Jesus, some people say, well, can you, can you get out on your own righteousness? If you get in, on, if you, if you get in with righteous Christ, can you get out on your own righteousness? I mean, can I commit some sin to get out of this thing? No. As Baptists, we believe in the perseverance of the saints. Don't believe that for a moment. You, you want to hear something shocking, something that will thrill you? Do you know you are as secure as Christ is? And you have as by as much chance of losing your salvation because it's in Christ as Jesus does of being expelled from the Trinity? You get that? Because to begin with, there is Christ, the only way to the Father. And if the only way you go is if He goes. Because we're in Him. And, if, and Christians worry about losing their salvation... Don't worry about losing your salvation. Worry about honoring God who gave you such a secure salvation. Live your life out of gratitude and not fear. Another passage of the same chapter, Romans chapter 8 and verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. We have received adoption and we cry, Papa. That's what it says in the Greek. Abba Father is the translation. In the Greek it says Daddy or Papa. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs. Join heirs with Jesus Christ. And we'll be glorified together with Him. Well, when Mary got this message, you know He's alive. Don't hang on to me, Mary. Mary, go tell the brothers. She gets up and goes. Verse 18, when Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that He had spoken these things unto her, I have seen the Lord. And He's told me all these things He's got to do before His ascension. And He's only going to be here a little while. Let me tell you something, folks. This was a changed little girl. Something different has happened to her. I have seen the Lord. And you know what? That's our testimony too tonight if you're Christians. Our testimony is that, well, I've read the Bible and I concur it's accurate. That's not our testimony. Our testimony is, hey, I've seen the Lord in my life and I want to share Him with you. That's our testimony. That's the message of Christianity, folks. Not second-handed theology, but first-handed experience. And so Jesus Christ appears first to Mary Magdalene to show himself faithful. Number two, he appeared secondly to send the faithful next week. Brother Blue closes in prayer, please. Any questions?